Hi everyone, this is lecture 15 for POS 273 International Relations, an online undergraduate course taught at the University of Maine, and I am your instructor, Rob Glover. Okay, so today we're going to look at the global environment, and specifically we're going to focus on um, three questions. One, how has global, environment, um, global environmental protection emerged as a priority historically? So this is a relatively new area of international relations. It's a relatively new uh, preoccupation and concern of world leaders, but it's increasingly becoming one of the most significant issues in international relations today. Uh, we'll talk about some of the structural challenges to state-based solutions to planetary environmental challenges. So we have a state-based system. Many of these problems are global in scope. Uh, and so how does that play out in terms of our efforts to address them? Uh, it certainly is, is a challenging environment. Uh, and, and can the system kind of evolve to address those challenges? And lastly, what are environmental regimes and what regimes have emerged to confront global climate change? So regimes has a very specific meaning in international relations. Uh, it means an issue-specific area of international law. And we have seen various regimes emerge to, um, to confront environmental issues. The real challenge um, in the contemporary period is, is climate change. And so what has emerged there? Uh, and what is the future of the global effort to combat climate change? So um, that is very much an open question. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit. We'll talk about why that has been made, uh, kind of rendered more open than it, than it was previously. All right, so um, first, before we talk about the specifics, we have to talk about an, a distinction that is often made in international relations between high and low politics. So uh, for much of the history of international relations, uh, basically this meant a distinction between security, international security, and really everything else, uh, every other priority. So states were focused on state survival, protecting their populations, ensuring that they had the military capacity to respond to threats. Uh, and even in earlier periods, you know, expansion, empire building, uh, expanding their territory. And then everything else kind of came second, right? Um, it's it's kind of like the distinction between you know high and low culture. There's the revered stuff that we put up on a pedestal, and then there's the things that are considered of secondary importance, and that applies to international politics as well. So until very recently, the types of things that would be included in low politics were basically things that were not related to war and peace and international security. So that would include um, the environment is, is one key area in which that was kind of placed secondary, but also things like um, the economy, trade, uh, you know, just matters that today we think of as high politics. That's part of what diplomacy exists to do. But really, prior to a, a relatively recent period, those things were considered secondary. And much of what statecraft revolved around were security issues and issues of of uh, conflict and kind of protecting your borders, protecting your population. So that's an important distinction to keep in mind. And for our purposes, talking about the environment, it means that this issue has really only emerged front and center very, very recently. This is a very recent development in international politics. So how did this emerge? How did this emerge as uh, a key global issue? There's really three factors. Right, there's three things that we need to talk about to uh, articulate why environmental issues have ascended from the realm of low politics and have become a central concern of really every uh, major world leader, every world leader, uh, very recently. The first would be the global environmental movement, really starting in the 1960s, civil society, people realizing that there were concerns that they had that were not being addressed by the government and were not being addressed by economic actors and engaging in activism. So in our country, the United States, we could talk about uh, you know, the environmental movement that emerged in relation to pollution, in relation to um, you know, clean air and clean water, um, access to public lands. And really that gets strength as a movement starting in the 1960s, emerging out of this, this eruption of activism in relation to all sorts of different things. Uh, the war movement, civil rights, women's rights, 
the environmental movement was part of that. It was people saying that this is also an issue that we care about deeply and we don't think the government is doing enough to address it. Uh, and that had impacts. You know, that had impacts in our domestic environment. We had uh, most of the pieces of major federal environmental legislation. Their inception was the late 1960s, the early 1970s. We had the first Earth Day. We had the creation of global civil society organizations like Greenpeace, for instance, uh, emerging out of the 1960s. And we had major pieces of legislation. You know, the creation of the EPA, uh, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act in the early 1970s. And that is not limited to the United States. Really, every advanced country in the world had some form of environmental movement starting in the 1960s. And so in the same way that they're placing this on the domestic agenda, they're placing it on the international agenda. Now states have to uh, think about the ways that their interactions over and above the level of the state, uh, the impacts that they could have environmentally, and, and activists are bringing to bear their resources on trying to ensure that those considerations are made. Second is the increased scientific understanding of environmental threats. So there was a belief for a long time that the, the earth, the world, uh, our, our physical environment is pretty resilient. You know, you can, you can respond, it can respond to uh, the types of stresses that we put on it, and it has an ability to kind of repair itself. And this really drove a lot of things. It drove, um, you know, policy. It drove uh, particularly economic development strategies. There was this notion that, yeah, you can kind of, you can develop and, and create and structure and, and evolve your society in ways that are environmentally harmful. And then once you've achieved a certain point of success or prosperity or, or development, you go back later and you, you repair those things. Um, if you know, we, you're taking this, this course at the University of Maine, if you think about Maine as a state, it's a good kind of cross section of, of that sort of thinking. Um, the key industries in this state for much of its modern history were environmentally intensive. They were extractive industries. You had pulp and paper and forestry, um, uh, fishing, lobstering, those sorts of things that are impacting the environment and drawing resources out of it. And initially in this state, it was done without a lot of thought towards sustainability of some of these resources and particularly not a lot of thought to the types of pollutants and dangerous chemicals that are being emitted back out into the environment. So we have this notion of Maine as this kind of pristine, untouched, natural uh, environment. And that really couldn't be further from the truth. Many of our waterways, many of our, our uh, you know, public lands by the 1960s, by the 1970s, have been polluted so extensively that they were really you know, kind of unsafe for human health. And um, that we don't think about that a lot. But there was a response in the same way that there was a response at the federal level. There was a response at the state level to dealing with some of those environmental impacts. Um, we began to understand through science, through scientific research, that the impacts that we were having can be very long lasting and sometimes irreversible. Right? Sometimes uh, you know, there are resources that we completely deplete or there are environmental hazards that we introduce into the world that the physical environment can't quickly bounce back from them. And, and that, was, that brought a different mentality to how we think about the environment. It's not just this thing that you can continue to abuse and eventually uh, when you get around to it, you address those, those ways in which you've harmed it, but you can actually do kind of permanent damage to our physical environment. Number three is um, disasters, uh, human-caused disasters that uh, made us aware of some of the long-term environmental costs of human activity, um, particularly risky forms of human activity. So the big one here, the one that really kind of brought into focus some of the ways in which we, uh, the, the futures that we could be facing were um, nuclear disasters. There was tremendous concern about nuclear disasters largely because of the byproducts of producing power using nuclear 
the, the nuclear process. Um, you produce these incredibly hazardous radioactive materials. And at the time we were developing this technology, the mentality was kind of like, well, we don't have a perfect way to dispose of or um, kind of re revise, recuperate this material yet. But science is evolving constantly. We'll figure out a way to do that. Uh, and we really have it. You know, the, the ways that we've, uh, we've dealt with uh, disposing of radioactive waste really centers around putting it in areas that are remote and, um, and, and putting it underground where the radioactive material can't be exposed to the air, can't be exposed to waterways and things like that. That's not the best solution. We also had a series of um, disasters at uh, nuclear producing facilities that made us aware of the ways in which you know, human beings could be exposed to uh, this radioactive material. So in the United States, we had um, a disaster at Three Mile Island. It was uh, basically a, a nuclear meltdown that had occurred, uh, and it didn't result in an explosion. That's the big threat, right, when you have a nuclear meltdown is that um, it, it, the, the facility, the, the um, machinery that you have within the nuclear facility will explode, and then all of that radioactive material that is contained within it will be put into the air, and then you know, uh, the physical environment will um, be impacted by that. So waterways, air, uh, people's homes and things will, will come into contact with that radioactivity. That didn't happen in Three Mile Island, uh, but we were pretty close. And so there was a, a no nuclear effort by activists to, to try and make us think about all of these nuclear power plants that were being built in the 1970s, the 1980s, um, and to really kind of push back against that and say, we don't have a good way of disposing of this material, and it introduces these threats. A few years later, in 1986, you had the um, disaster at Chernobyl in the Soviet Union, at that time the Soviet Union. Um, that was a facility in which there was a meltdown and there was an explosion. And this picture that you see on the right-hand side is the hastily constructed solution to dealing with that explosion. Basically, um, you know, this, this facility overheated. It, it began to look like there were uh, gaps in training and gaps in kind of fail-safes to make sure that this wouldn't happen. Uh, the facility overheated. There was a meltdown. There was an explosion. And then uh, a huge cloud of radioactive material went up over the Soviet Union. And then because of the winds, drifted west. So Eastern Europe, Central Europe, and eventually Western Europe were exposed to this nuclear material. The Soviet Union was very secretive about this. We actually didn't find it. There was no you know, press conference in which the Soviet Union came out and said, we've had a disaster. It was scientists that started to detect higher levels of radiation. and um, I could actually detect that there had been some sort of significant significant explosion uh, in this area, and it was only after a few months that we figured out that this this had actually happened. Um, so the solution that they crafted to this was basically to send a bunch of people into that area to to evacuate, you know, the local population and things like that. Send in first responders and and uh, engineers and, and construction folks, and to rapidly build this concrete structure around the facility that is called the scarcophagus. Um, it's, it's not an ideal solution, and uh, it, it is beginning to show its age, and it is, you know, periodic, periodically they will send in people to kind of repair it and patch it up. Uh, but if this whole structure ever collapsed, we would essentially have the same thing again. There would be another cloud of radioactive material that was released into the air. Um, significant cost to human health as a result. Uh, higher incidences of uh, various cancers and uh, birth defects, disorders. The entire area to this day is just empty. You, you can't even, it's uh, controlled by the Russian military. You can't go near it. Um, so that's the scale of disaster that we're talking about. There are a series of other things as well. Uh, famines, there was a, a chemical plant in Bhopal, India that exposed thousands of people to toxic gas and, and killed thousands of people uh, in the 1980s as well. So these disasters 
make us aware of the fact that one, our, our environment is not as resilient as we hoped. Um, and there can be long-term impacts of some of the types of activities that we're engaged in, but also that our bodies are vulnerable, right? When we're exposed to toxins, when we're exposed to pollutants, when we're exposed to radioactivity, uh, even in you know trace amounts, small amounts, that begins to have effects on human health. And so that really drives um, interest in the environment among the population as they're seeing the impacts of some of these activities, but also increasingly policymakers and those engaged in international relations have to be aware of those costs and those risks. So um, one of the things that you begin to hear in the 1960s um, in relation to the way that we interact with our environment is this idea of carrying capacity. Uh, basically, there was a lot of fear Really, I guess there still is to an extent, but it's abated a little bit. But in the 1960s and 1970s, the tremendous fear was population growth, that the human population was growing in a way that was unsustainable, and we would deplete resources, and we would push the ability of our physical ecosystems to its limits and, and eventually to collapse. And um, this, again, kind of goes against that mentality of like, the environment, the earth, being able to basically respond indefinitely to what we do to it. This was saying, no, there are limits to growth. There are limits to, to economic growth, technological growth, and even population growth. And if we ex go beyond those limits, extend ourselves beyond those limits, then um, there are all sorts of secondary effects. It doesn't just mean that you know there'll be less food for everybody, but then you play out the subsequent steps of what that means. And we're talking about uh, you know, social disorder, civil war, breakdown of stable political systems into more tribal warlord type systems, uh, and, and that those things have lasting impacts. So we have to attend to what our physical environment can realistically support. And that begins to shape thinking about how we interact with um, the environment and eventually gives rise to this idea, this principle, which now I think is really part of the bedrock, at least rhetorically, of how the international community talks about development and how we talk about development both at the domestic level as well, uh, this idea of sustainable development. The UN established a commission in 1987. So this is still, um, you know, it's, it's in our recent past, but this was really the UN's first attempt to grapple with in a significant way the environmental concerns that were being raised and the relationship between economic development, that countries want to grow, they want to industrialize, they want to um, you know, essentially go through the process that we went through in our industrialized society or Western Europe went through in their, their society. But how do we do that in a way that protects the environment? We in the United States and Western Europe and, and the, the countries that had industrialized uh, starting in the, the 19th century, they had done so in a way that the environment wasn't really a concern. You know, if you were, if you had a factory in, in Manchester, England, in the 19th century, or, or Boston, Massachusetts, in the 19th century, what you did with pollutants, what you did with waste, um, how you, the types of resources that you used, and the way that you got them, there wasn't really a regulatory framework provided by the state to. Um, to guide how you do that. And so it was really kind of the Wild West. And the hope is that we can create uh, a regulatory framework as more countries begin to industrialize and they begin to, to move um, you know, towards a, a situation, an economic situation that resembles ours, that they don't do so in the same way, that they don't simply abuse the environment um, and then hope that they'll be able to attend to it later. The key imperative here, the key concern, is really that that can't happen. Um, you know, the, the, if all of the the world's countries choose to develop in the way that we did, then the physical environment will not be able to support it. So, what that commission asked, what it set forth as a principle, is that you commit to a trajectory of development that meets the needs of the present without compromising future ability to which is significant. It's saying not only do you have responsibilities to the people in your country, 
right now, but you have responsibilities to future generations and really to the future generations of the entire globe. It's not limited to your own self-interest or your own national interest, but you need to think about individuals in the future and um, people outside your country. And this was formulated, uh, these ideas were formulated as some of the new challenges, some of the new threats, such as climate change, were really only beginning to be better understood. So, um, you know, talk about climate change as an issue really began in the 1980s. There, there was really, we were, the science on climate change and some of the actual ways in which uh, we are impacting the environment had been hypothesized about. But the actual models, the data, the climate science as a field really only began to emerge right around this period. And sustainable development aligns pretty well with that notion that um, you know, burning fossil fuels and development through the intensive use of fossil fuels, that it has really significant impacts for future generations. That that can actually, you know, that strategy pursued aggressively can make it so that future generations will inhabit a world that looks completely different than the one that we live in today. So we've made some progress on environmental issues. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the areas in which we have seen success. Basically, we've managed to have success in confronting uh, what I call the low-hanging fruit of environmental issues. So what are some areas in which we have had binding international agreements that have um, really had a significant impact? Well, there are things that are relatively easy to fix. Um, comparatively speaking. So, uh, for instance, the radioactive fallout from nuclear testing. There are international agreements, have been international agreements for decades that we won't conduct nuclear testing above ground, right? And that has been successful largely because you have a relatively small number of states that are engaged in nuclear testing or were engaged in nuclear testing. Now there's actually a, a nuclear test ban treaty that limits nuclear testing even further. Um, but you're talking about agreement between uh, you know, a small group of countries to, um, to, to address this issue. And the idea was that we shouldn't have above ground nuclear tests, that it pushes all of this radioactivity out into the environment. And then that lands in waterways, that impacts animal life, that impacts human health. Um, and basically, the countries involved in nuclear development said, yeah, that makes sense, right? And it's going to impact us more than anyone, right? The United States, most of our testing was done in the American Southwest. So we didn't want our own population to um, be exposed to this. We also saw progress on um, CFCs in aerosol sprays. I remember when I was a kid, when I was young, there was a uh, Know, tremendous focus on aerosol sprays, introducing CFCs uh, into the atmosphere and the environmental impacts that would result as a, as a result of that. Um, that has been addressed largely because there exist alternatives, right? There existed other ways that we could dispense these sprays. And so the industry just moved on. They didn't want to be subject to uh, you know, large scale lawsuits as a result of their environmental impacts. And, so that's a, a relatively easy one to deal with. Protection of waterways and air in formal industrial areas. The former, formal industrial, uh, for, former industrial, I should say former industrial countries, uh, have in, in many instances done a good job of uh, cleaning up the waterways and the air and pursuing economic development in a, a more friendly way. So there are some areas in which we have had success. Um, what unites all of these is uh, these are areas in which either our security or our economic interest or both aligned with environmental imperatives. And individuals, uh, oftentimes you know, activists, civil society groups, had made clear the demonstrable impacts of the problem for policymakers in those localized areas. So they're responding oftentimes to their own citizens, and they're responding in a situation in which your security interests, your economic interests line up with what the environmentally friendly thing is to do. Now, those were still difficult international agreements to hash out, and it's difficult to get people to sign on. But comparatively speaking, 
relative to some of the challenges that we face today, those are easier issues to deal with because of that alignment, the alignment of interests, both security and economic interests and environmental interests. Um, what becomes way, way more difficult is when you have the environmentally friendly thing to do and the economic or the security uh, interest, right? That, those two paths diverge and the solutions have to be pursued uh, in, in a long-term manner, right? It's not a quick fix, it's not an easy solution, but it's something in which the environmental uh, path and the economic and security path diverge and it's something that you have to do for a longer period of time. That's, I think, probably closer to what we confront with, with climate change. If you extend the time, high, time horizon out enough, you know, eventually everyone is impacted and the viability of the earth as a place to live is impacted. But if you focus on the short-term interest and you know, what your GDP growth is going to be in the next year or how fossil fuel companies are going to profit as a result of uh, doing what they're doing and continuing to drill, continuing to produce their products, um, the cost that would be borne by consumers within your country, you start to see divergence. And it's much, much harder uh, to pursue the environmentally friendly path when there's those divergence, divergences between the two interests, the two sets of interests. All right, so um, the challenge with environmental issues is really our state system. Most of the environmental issues that we deal with tend to transcend individual states. Right? So if we, if you know, Canada decides that they're going to, to pollute their waterways, right, eventually that's going to have an impact on us. If we decide that we're going to push a bunch of pollutants out into the air uh, and we're going to completely dismantle our framework for clean air and regulating that, that's going to have an impact on neighboring states and eventually the whole world. Right? We share an ecosystem. Nobody can kind of say, all right, our border is right here. And so these uh, pollutants or these, these negative impacts that you're introducing into the world, they're not going to enter our environment. So if in order to have an effective solution to a problem or a potential problem, you need to have monitoring and enforcement. But the only real... Um, the most effective monitoring and enforcement tools that we have in relation to environmental problems still are largely lodged. They're stuck in individual states. We don't have a global version of the EPA. We don't have a global version of uh, you know, these regulatory frameworks that exist at the state level. And this is all really, really new, right? So we really have only understood and had civil society pushing world leaders to understand the severity of these issues for 20, 30, at most 40 years, right? So this is a pretty significant institutional change that would need to come. And it's, it's also on high stakes issues. You're asking countries to make trade-offs between economic development today in a certain type of manner, right? a certain way of pursuing economic development that could have negative environmental effects. Um, you're asking them to, to put that aside and think, one, about future generations, so project themselves you know, two or three generations down the road, and think about people that are outside their country, think in terms of a global community. That's a pretty significant change in how most world leaders think about these issues. So that's difficult, and that's um, you know, potentially time-consuming to, to actually you know, achieve that sort of change. So um, one of the terms that we use to refer to this is the tragedy of the commons or the tragedy of the global commons. Um, tragedy of the commons, you may have encountered uh, tragedy of commons. It, it refers to uh, instances in which resources are limited, but they're not owned by anyone. That's the commons, and they're prone to overuse and abuse. So um, the commons actually refers to uh, agricultural grazing land that was available for common use. So today, for instance, when you go to Boston, there's Boston Common. Um, that area, that kind of green space in the middle of Boston, used to be an agricultural area in which people from all over the city could come and their animals could graze and eat. 
and that's that's pretty common um, you know throughout Europe in the 16th 17th 18th century you had these areas that were kind of common property that individuals could use um, the issue with that is that those resources are limited they're not owned by anyone and it actually creates this incentive to overuse them right to abuse them um, you want to you don't know how long this resource is going to last you don't know uh, if it's going to be bought or, or someone is going to take it away from you. And so, you know, you should try to use as much of it as possible uh, before it, A, becomes depleted from overuse, or B, somebody takes it away and puts it into private hands. Um, so that's what the tragedy of the commons refers to, is that we need resources that are commonly available, but that commonness of them can make them prone to overuse and abuse, and can either necessitate them being put into private hands, taken away from the general public, or they can just become depleted and not useful for anyone. We can also think about that as a global issue. Right? We can think about the global commons. So global commons refers to global resources that are not owned by anyone, they're shared, they're universally valued, and they're non-excludable. So uh, resources like the world's ocean, the world's clean air, these are things that we all need. They support life on Earth. We couldn't exist without these resources. Um, so they're universally valued. They're shared by definition. Right? We can't kind of put up a wall and say, this is our air. You can't have any of our air. And they're non-excludable. Right? We can't prevent people from utilizing them. But they, it does create this incentive for overuse, at least in the short term. If we think about our short-term individual or national interest, we have an incentive to utilize these resources as we see fit because um, you know, we know that, that others could use them. For instance, think of you know, like fish stocks. Um, you can always, there's always articles about the extent to which we have depleted the world's marine resources. And that's because in the absence of a global regulatory framework for you know, how much tuna you can fish or how much crab you can harvest, uh, there can be a potential incentive to overuse. And, and particularly once you go out into international waters, once you get away from shorelines that we do have regulatory frameworks for, this becomes a real issue. Um, from the point of view of individual state actors or individual uh, fishermen, there is a tremendous incentive to utilize as much of that resource as possible before it goes away. So it's hard to compel states to think in terms of a global interest and in terms of an intergenerational interest. And there's really no incentive to pay the costs associated with overcoming the problem, right? As long as we think in terms of short-term individual interests, there is a certain issue that arises with some of these resources where countries assume that they can free ride on the efforts of others, right? So, um, you know, if you're Mexico or you're Guatemala or you're Brazil, uh, you, you look at issues that are happening with clean air, and you, you know, you might have an internal interest in creating a regulatory framework to ensure that your air is better, right? But you know that in and of itself, if the United States doesn't sign on to that, if the big power in the Western Hemisphere that's um, you know potentially producing the most pollutants doesn't sign on to that, then you're going to be uh, negatively affected by their actions. And so you might just wait until the big powerful actor decides to do something. And there might be this sense that you can what's called free ride on the efforts of others. So it's a it's really it's an issue of priorities and it's an issue of, of kind of what you what you place as central. Uh, and it can be very, very hard to snap states out of this short term individual interest. It's particularly the case once you get into um, the confrontations between the global north and the global south. Uh, a lot of countries that are you know, beginning to develop, beginning to industrialize, beginning to experience the real, for the, for the first time, real prosperity uh, in their societies and real kind of economic uh, growth and dynamism, look at the United States, look at Western Europe, look at Australia and Canada and Japan, and when they're told that they have to develop in a different way, a more environmentally sustainable way, they you know, perhaps rightly accuse those major powers of hypocrisy and accuse them of essentially slamming the door shut on economic development behind them. 
uh, because they didn't adhere to any of these rules. They didn't adhere to any of these environmental frameworks. They did as they pleased and they developed in a very environmentally stressful way. And now, um, you know, the, the tables have turned. So it is incredibly, incredibly complex to get the global to move forward on this issue and to think about these, these concerns and these, um, the types of changes that, that are necessary in different ways. So I'm going to play you a short clip of David Held. David Held's a political scientist at the London School of Economics, and he's really interested in um, globalization and, in particular, the, the intersection or the mismatch between the types of global challenges that we face and the types of global institutions or the system of global governance that we have. So the clip itself is about um, eight minutes long. We won't listen to all of it, just the first few minutes. But I think he lays out some of the core issues really well. And as he talks about this, think about the environment as an issue and some of the institutions and the organi international organizations that we've talking, been talking about in this course and um, potentially kind of you know the challenges that those organizations face when it comes to dealing with environmental issues. I think we face almost an iceberg structure of issues. That is to say, we understand the tip, but we don't see how deep the problems go. We face three core sets of challenges. Those facing are the global commons, like environment, water deficit, climate change, and so on. Those concerning our humanity, uh, the spread of diseases, pandemics, epidemics, poverty, conflict. And those challenges concerning our rule books, financial market rules, trade rules, waste, toxic disposal rules, and so on. And at every level now, we know at least one thing, that the nation state is no longer adequate alone to resolve these common, almost global issues in most cases. By global, I simply mean they are transborder, intercontinental in scope and form, and that they bite deeply into the well-being and the future well-being of populations across the world. So we know that state, nation states alone can't handle these problems, but we also know that nation states and the history of nation states collaborating together to meet these challenges is not good. I'd just like to pick up on four briefly. I think we live at a moment of parallel crisis in global governance in the world. I call these parallel worlds. If you think of financial market regulation, we are faced with serious questions about what the future rules will be of financial market regulation but we're nowhere near coming up with adequate solutions. Climate change, the recent mega conference in Copenhagen, was by all intents and purposes a, a, a near disaster. While there are some benefits, clearly one thing that has not triumphed is collective goodwill, the collective interest, the humankind's common concerns. Take trade regulation and trade rules. The Doha round is, 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 is making no progress and is stalled. And finally, the year in which we now live, 2010, is the year where we asked, can we renew the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty? And it doesn't look good. So here, these four issues could be thought of in isolation. What's happening to finance, what's happening to climate change, what's happening to trade, etc. But we shouldn't look at them in isolation. We should look at them together. They're not sui generis. They reflect a number of things. They reflect a global shift in the world. That is a shift that isn't away from the nation state, but it makes the nation state no longer the adequate silo container to resolve these problems. They create profound transboundary issues which escape the control of existing mechanisms of accountability and control. And they raise questions about the capacity of human beings to collaborate across border, which is profound. But this is a time when the ways in which we've done business in the world, the 1945 multilateral settlement, is running out of steam. It is no longer representative. It freezes the power structure of 1945 into its core institutions. It is no longer accountable, and it no longer has the financial means to provide the resources for addressing global goods and global bads. So we live at a moment where we face these intensive and extensive global issues at the same time the 1945 challenge is exhausted and at the same time there's a changing balance of power going on in the world. Okay, <clears throat> so we'll stop it right there. <clears throat>
I think he he raises a number of issues here. Um, the core one that we're concerned with today is is climate change, and and I think that the key question that he addresses here is is the state really uh, he calls it the adequate silo, right? Is the state the entity which can provide leadership on these issues? And um, the suggestion I want to raise, you know as we talk about the environment is that it's really not, it's institutionally not well equipped to deal with some of these transboundary issues. Um, but we don't really have anything else that has evolved to, to address these issues and to create the settings in which that type of collaboration can occur. So we're in a really tough spot uh, when it comes to at least certain forms of environmental stress and our attempts to confront them at the international level. Um, <clears throat> So globally, uh, I think what we're facing is the question of whether the existing state-based institutions are capable of addressing the global environmental challenges before us. And as Held, I think, you know, articulates, and I think a lot of people would agree with him, the preliminary evidence suggests that it, uh, these, these institutions might not be. Either the institutions have to evolve or we have to kind of create changing structures. There's a lot that needs to happen in order for us to be able to address these global All right, so we talked about the global commons, some potential solutions to this issue of the global commons. Um, when we deal with issues of the commons, there's basically, we've seen two strategies at the domestic level to try to address these things. There's not a lot of great examples at the global level, but we've seen two, two strategies at the domestic level. One is state control, right? So if there is a common resource that's being overused uh, and it's, it's in danger of being degraded or, or obliterated altogether, the state will take control of the resource, it'll monitor its use, and it'll assure its preservation, mainly by uh, changing the incentive structure around use. It assigns penalties, it uh, introduces costs for overuse. So the quintessential state example is um, land use, if you think of like conservation efforts. Um, we have national parks in this country. The reason we have national parks is there was a movement to create these spaces that would not be um, prone to overuse, prone to, to private control, prone to uh, you know, economic activities that could result in their degradation. So there's a whole movement in this country to, to have national parks and then eventually state level parks. There's also land trusts that um, operate more locally. And the whole idea um, is, is to take that, that out of uh, public circulation, to, to uh, take it out of, of um, to introduce costs associated with its use, right? And, and to assign penalties for uh, use that, that might result in degradation of that common resource. Now, land trusts are a little bit different because usually it's, you know, a nonprofit or something. But many times the actor that was in control of this resource was the state. Um, the other way that we can think about protecting commons, common resources, is privatization. So you take a resource and you put it in private hands. Uh, that private actor is going to attach some fee or cost to its use. It um, has been done in, in the past with things like utilities, right, where we have an infrastructure to provide, say, water or electricity. And so many times, initially, that's a publicly owned and publicly financed infrastructure. Uh, and then you, you transfer it over into a private actor, uh, and they manage it, assure its upkeep, and there's usually a profit incentive for them to ensure that this publicly useful resource um, is protected and expanded and, and maintained, right? So privatization is another option. It's usually the more controversial option where you take something that's owned by the public and transfer it into private hands. But that's another potential way that we deal with these issues of the commons. Now, at the international level, either scenario, either having some sort of regulatory framework over and above a common resource or transferring in some way this resource over into private hands, it's hard to think about what that would look like, right? It's hard to think about how that would actually play out and it would require a massive amount of coordination. For many of these issues, I just don't think privatization is possible, right? Like how would you privatize a common environmental resource? Um, I don't know that you could. Generally, what we're talking about is some sort of state 
regulatory framework, but the issue at the international level is there's no state, there's no actor that really exists over and above the level of our nation states that has the power to police and introduce costs and, um, and to, to regulate uh, the resources that we share. So it's, it's very, very difficult and we've tr kind of been trying to create a framework that resembles that state control model in advance of having any sort of state that can effectively enforce it, essentially devolve um, enforcement for some of these issues down to the, the nation state level. And that's really tricky to do. It's very difficult. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about this in the context of climate change. Uh, just kind of a, a quick overview of, of what climate change is. I, I assume everybody you know, in this, at this point has heard about climate change and is aware of the issue of climate change. Um, it's, I want to go into the science a little bit, just kind of like the mechanism of what it is. I sometimes, you know, students will, will use like climate change and pollution and, and things interchangeably. And it's, it's important to specify exactly what we mean by, um, by climate change. So just the mechanics of climate change first, this is, there's a few images here. Um, the first image on your, your left is really what, it's how climate change works, right? It's, it's the mechanics of climate change. The second issue, uh, the second graphic, infographic on your, your right is some of the impacts in terms of, of what can happen um, when climate change occurs and, and when we see increased warming, um, what some of the secondary impacts are. So. Um, climate change refers to really the root of climate change is just the trapping of gases uh, within the Earth's atmosphere. So um, basic, basic stuff, you know, sunlight has to go through the atmosphere. Uh, it passes through the atmosphere. It warms the Earth. That's essential, right? We couldn't, the Earth would not be habitable if we didn't have the sun as our, our major energy source and we didn't um, have this capacity to, to warm our planet into a state in which we could, we could live. And then that there's radiation that is kind of bounced back and is given off the Earth um, as the sun's rays hit it. And most of that escapes into outer space. Some of it remains trapped. And again, that's essential. We have this really fragile ecosystem that some of that warmth has to kind of remain within our atmosphere to keep us in our, our sweet spot temperature-wise. But a lot of that just kind of refracts back out into space. It just you know, think of like you throw a basketball at a wall and it bounces back. Most of that radiation bounces back. Um, some of it is trapped by gases in the air. Those gases, <clears throat> there are a number of them. Um, one of them is CO2, uh, but it also includes things like methane. And so when we're talking about climate change, it's not simply CO2. It's, it's all of those gases that can potentially trap radiation and heat within the atmosphere. And one of the real serious concerns is, is methane. Methane that's released by you know, decomposition of organic material, methane that's released by uh, you know, cows in agriculture, they play a, a role as well. But CO2 has been the one that, that we've zeroed in on, um, largely because of the fact that it is a byproduct of burning fossil fuels. So we're increasing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, we're increasing the amount of you know, carbon that's, that's in our atmosphere. And right now we're at a spot in which um, the, the radiation that's trapped within the atmosphere is, is where it needs to be in order to sustain life and keep the earth warm. Um, but as we trap more and more of that radiation, we're seeing the creeping up of temperature. So, um, you know, the original language that people talked about was, uh, was global warming, right? And what they meant by global warming is that in the aggregate, this increased trapping of radiation is leading to uh, a, a rise in temperature. But I think the, the, language of climate change is being used because it captures the fact that um, you know, some people think of global warming and they think, oh, things are just going to get increasingly hotter and hotter and hotter. And in the aggregate, they are. But the volatility that is introduced by a higher temperature uh, results in a series of things which might not just be hotter days. It might be harsher winters or more precipitation or more extreme weather events, <clears throat> um, you know, changing, changing currents and the, the ocean might, might uh, react differently as its temperature creeps up. And um, really the serious concern with radiation is that we begin to see sea level rise, right? So as more and more of the Earth's 
ice melts, then we start to see um, sea level rise, which plays into some of these weather effects, but also begins to have uh, you know impacts just on coastlines uh, and the habitability of certain areas of the world in which you know the vast majority of the world's population lives in proximity to to coastlines. It's been our traditional way of transporting people, transporting resources, and so. Um, many of the world's coastal cities are now preparing for, you know, what does a, a increase in sea level mean for us? And some of these cities uh, are, exist at such levels of elevation that if some of the projected ranges of sea level rise occur, uh, we could be talking about you know, there's, there's not a New York City, there's not a Boston, there's not, these, these areas don't exist anymore. So um, the, the core problem is just this trapping of radiation by gases, right? Uh, but the, the real thing that, that uh, the world's leaders, civil society groups, environmental groups have, have zeroed in on is CO2, because CO2 is a byproduct of our economic and industrial activity. That's something that we can potentially change. Right? So you see on the right here some of the potential impacts of climate change, um, glacial melting, increased evaporation from reservoirs, water bodies, wetlands. Uh, drought would be a concern. Um, weather volatility is a concern. Um, but beyond that, you know, you have all of the kind of secondary and tertiary impacts. Um, the system that we have right now is is pretty well poised to produce enough food that the current population of, of the world needs. And so if, even if you see kind of minor changes in um, what the environment looks like in terms of temperature, that can impact our ability to grow food and where food is grown. And so then once you have food shortages, you start to have social unrest, uh, prices rise, and you know, there's, there's a whole series of, of secondary tertiary steps. It's a, a more complex system than simply we're going to have hotter days, but it has political and economic and social impacts. Um, when you talk about climate change, when you read things about climate change, you'll often hear uh, the, the language used of, of the pre-industrial period, right? And that's kind of our baseline for exactly what has humankind's impact been on the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. And there's this all-important metric, which is parts per million, right? So if you took, you know, the, the, if you took a sample of the atmosphere, how much of that would be CO2? And, um, at different periods in our history with different levels of industrial activity, we've had different parts per million uh, levels. So where do we stand right now? So that pre-industrial period, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere was around 280 to 290 parts per million. This is before um, you know, the advent of industrialization with factories and smokestacks churning carbon out into the atmosphere is before um, the real intensive use of uh, the internal combustion engines that we have that are powered by fossil fuels and produce a huge amount of CO2. Um, and so that is, that's kind of our baseline, right? In the last 150 years, we've greatly increased the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere. And f for a long time, the climate scientists um, introduced this as kind of a, a, a warning point this number of 350 parts per million. If we go above that number, we start to introduce really, really serious changes to the climate and all of those secondary effects, weather patterns, uh, our ability to grow food, etc. cetera. Uh, we've now surpassed that 350 parts per million, and I believe now are over 400 parts per million. And so we're at a really serious, pivotal moment in terms of what do we do to ensure at the very least, that we, we don't continue to creep up, right? We don't continue to introduce more CO2 into the atmosphere uh, and, and hopefully begin to, to uh, allow the environment to repair itself a little bit. And this has become a key international issue. I mean, this has been driving international negotiations now for um, a, a couple of decades, right? The major piece of um, international law, really, um, that, that was crafted to deal with uh, CO2 emissions initially was something called the Kyoto Protocol. 
it's named after the the place in Japan uh, where it was it was drafted. It was drafted uh, by a UN group in 1997 with um, representatives of member countries, and there were 187 signatories. So 187 countries signed on to this. Um, and the way that the protocol was structured, there actually had to be a certain number of countries um, who constitute a certain percentage of the world's CO2 emissions for this to enter into force. So it wasn't actually until um, Russia, the country Russia, signed on to the Kyoto Protocol that it entered into force. So there is this lag between when it's drafted, when it's signed, and then getting the countries that signed it to ratify it within their own domestic political structures for it to enter into force. And it was Russia's involvement in 2005 that made it binding. So what does the Kyoto Protocol do, or what did the Kyoto Protocol do? It set binding targets for carbon emissions for certain countries to reach by 2030. Certain countries um, signing on to this agreement agreed to either <clears throat> maintain their current levels or reduce their carbon emissions in this uh, you know, eight-year time span. And there were penalties if they didn't do that. Right Now, what's interesting about the Kyoto Protocol is it created basically two different categories of countries. It created the countries that were um, industrialized, developed, uh, had you know, significant um, economic production, and were responsible for a significant amount of the world's carbon emissions. And it put them in kind of one category. It said, okay, you have to commit to, to uh, either you know, maintaining your, your current level, not creeping up in carbon emissions, or actually reducing carbon emissions. The vast majority of the world's countries, though, didn't have to do this. Developing economies were held exempt. So if they were um, still you know, growing and industrializing, they didn't have to commit to these targets, which could introduce economic costs. Developing in a more sustainable, more green way, uh, you, know, you have to, you have to uh, be slightly more attuned to the, the environmental costs of your development and that can introduce costs. And so the Kyoto Protocol said, these countries don't yet have to adhere to these, these targets. And it is, it's eventually, you know, there would be a second commitment period, there would be a second negotiation. And then we're, the idea is that we're going to bring more and more of the world's um, countries, including some, some of these developing economies into the group of countries that have to commit to either, um, you know, maintaining existing levels or reducing carbon emissions. Controversially, these developing economies included countries like China and India, who even by 1997 had experienced enormous, enormous economic growth um, and were not you know, quite on the same level as a sub-Saharan African country like Tanzania or a country like Bangladesh, right? That is much more, um, much more what we would think of in, in terms of a traditional developing economy. So that was somewhat controversial. And that actually ended up being one of the key points that led the United States, who, uh, you know, as a country was instrumental in helping draft the Kyoto Protocol, um, they would not ratify the Kyoto Protocol. So the United States never participated in the Kyoto Protocol in the ways that these other countries that ratified Kyoto did. Okay. This map gives you a sense of kind of um, how, those, how those schedules break down, right? The schedule of the two countries. Um, pretty much all of Africa, uh, uh, much of, of South and Central Asia, China and India, as we mentioned, Southeast Asia, and pretty much all of um, Latin America w signed on to the Kyoto Protocol, but did so as a developing country and did so with a different set of expectations in terms of what they had to do to cut emissions. The European Union, Russia, Japan, uh, Australia, they signed on as uh, developed countries. And so they actually had you know, meaningful cuts that they had to pledge to reach in this first commitment period. Canada signed on and was or originally a member of the Kyoto Protocol and eventually withdrew in 2011 due to changing political circumstances within Canada. Um, the United States, uh, this was originally drafted under the Clinton administration. Uh, Bush, uh, the second Bush came into power and was kind of um, not as receptive to the Kyoto Protocol as the Clinton administration. And even um, 
uh, kind of said that you know we don't like the way that this is structured. We don't like the, the fact that countries like China and India don't have to make commitments, and we did. So the United States signed the treaty under Clinton, uh, but then never never ratified it. So we never actually participated in the Kyoto Protocol. So um, when it came time to negotiate the second commitment period, there, the seeds had been sown for this to be a really difficult process. Countries like um, you know, the United States, Canada, even uh, the European powers were saying, okay, China, India, now it is your time to step up. Now you have to commit to these, these emissions reductions. Uh, and there, there was this sense that, okay, more of the world's countries need to participate. It basically broke down the negotiations uh, along lines of economic position in the world, right? So the more established, developed economies had certain expectations. The recently developed or still developing economies of the world had a certain set of expectations that made it a very difficult atmosphere in which to try to extend this protocol. And it wasn't, um, it wasn't actually successful. So the Kyoto Protocol existed for a time, and then they weren't able to reach an agreement. The world's powers weren't able to reach an agreement uh, on the second commitment period. And then we had this period in which there really was no framework. Right? There was nothing to replace Kyoto. They couldn't establish a second commitment period for this, this emissions reduction agreement. And they didn't establish anything to... Um, to replace it. So this uh, is a little bit dated at this point, but it, it shows you how in the absence of a framework, we do see um, pretty significant increases in CO2 emissions. So the United States, uh, Canada, two countries that had either didn't sign or withdrew from the Kyoto Protocol, their emissions, CO2 emissions actually went up um, 7%, 8%. Uh, China, India, their emissions went up significantly in that period, 102%, 60%. So it does then show that in the absence of a framework that can introduce costs for CO2 emissions, um, countries left to their own devices might not do this as a, as a function of their, their domestic law. You know, they, they kind of won't do it on their own. They need the commitment of the international community to actually perform. There are some countries, though, that we can point out that uh, either remained steady or did decrease. Uh, so in Germany, there is a real commitment to reducing CO2 emissions and addressing the issue of climate change. And they experienced the 6%, 6 decrease in CO2 emissions, even without uh, being party to any sort of international agreement compelling them to do so. The UK as well, although theirs is a, a less significant decrease of 1%. But with, with this, even kind of remaining constant, even not increasing your level of CO2 emissions is oftentimes, uh, you know, that's, that's a step forward. That's better than we've done in the past. Um, so I'm going to play a short clip for you here. This is just talking about some of kind of where we are at in terms of um, climate change globally right now. And then we'll talk about some of the most recent efforts to address uh, global climate change. Historians may look to 2015 as the year when it really started hitting the fan. Some snapshots. In just the past few months, record-setting heat waves in Pakistan and India each killed more than a thousand people. London reached 98 degrees Fahrenheit during the hottest July day ever recorded in the UK. In California, suffering from its worst drought in a millennium, a 50-acre brush fire swelled 70-fold in a matter of hours, jumping across the I-15 freeway during rush hour traffic. On July 20th, James Hansen, the former NASA climatologist who brought climate change to the public's attention in the summer of 1988, issued a bombshell. He and a team of climate scientists had identified a newly important feedback mechanism off the coast of Antarctica that suggests mean sea levels could rise 10 times faster than previously predicted, 10 feet by 2065. Okay, so that clip gives you a sense of kind of where we stand right now in terms of some of the impacts that we're seeing. Um, and, and it also, it's from 2015, so it gives you a sense of um, kind of where we were in the aftermath of Kyoto 
uh, in the absence of a regulatory framework, at least to guide us down the path of, of CO2 emissions. Um, and we're going to close just by talking about where we, we stand right now. What is the framework that we have for reducing CO2 emissions at this moment? There was, in the aftermath of Kyoto's collapse, there was an attempt to craft an international agreement, an international framework uh, at a meeting in Copenhagen, which David held in the clip that you watched in this lecture, um, referenced a little bit, only to kind of say that it was regarded as a, a spectacular failure. Um, there were a lot of tensions in the aftermath of Kyoto's collapse, and, and really they broke down along these global north versus global south sorts of lines. Um, with lots of countries uh, very hesitant to, hesitant to commit to reducing CO2 emissions without serious uh, steps from other emerging world powers and, and really kind of a global effort. That two-tiered framework that Kyoto had set in motion um, probably wasn't going to sustain itself and there was going to need to be some sort of new framework that didn't kind of create you know, two separate camps based on levels of development. Uh, and so Copenhagen just didn't really produce much of anything. It, it produced a, a statement of principle that there was no framework that emerged that actually guided CO2 emissions. And we saw the, the consequences of that in terms of the CO2 emissions that countries were producing. So the world's leaders met in Paris and they crafted a framework in uh, late 2015 that is now kind of our, our global guide for reducing CO2 emissions. And it's by definition, it's a loose framework, it's decentralized, it takes a lot of the responsibility uh, of reducing CO2 emissions and devolves it down to the state level. And the general sentiment is that it needed to be that way, that you couldn't have uh, a kind of you know, top-down framework um, that introduced really meaningful regulatory and uh, uh, oversight apparatuses in the aftermath of Kyoto. So there's agreement of, on the overarching goal, which is to keep the world under two degrees Celsius rise from those pre-industrial levels before we had you know, the, the big factories and before we had um, internal combustion engines that were producing CO2 as a waste product uh, to try to, to keep us uh, to below two degrees Celsius rise from those pre-industrial levels. But the mechanics of the agreement really take a lot of the responsibility for the targets, the specific targets, national targets for emissions, and the plans for achieving those targets. Uh, it takes the, them and, and farms them out to the national level. That's a country's responsibility. So countries that sign on to the Paris Climate Treaty present uh, a set of, of goals and their plans for reaching those goals. And the plans that they put forward are, are you know, pretty, uh, pretty set in stone. They can make changes to those plans, but they can only do so with, quote, a view to enhancing its level of ambition. So if a country, for instance, said we're going to reduce CO2 emissions by, uh, you know, 30% by 2030, and they start to do the work to make that happen at the domestic level, and uh, it turns out to be really hard and there's organized interests that are resisting those changes and they come back to the international community and say, ah, actually, we're going to do half that. We'll do 15% by 2030. They can't do that under the Paris Climate Treaty. They're not allowed to. They can step up their goals. They can say, oh, you know, like we're, we think this is a serious issue and we're going to try to reduce CO2 emissions by 40%. But the only changes that can be made can be, can be made in the the direction of more ambitious goals, right? So um, the, the framework that we have then really takes the responsibility for CO2 emissions targets and the plans for reducing those emissions uh, and takes them out to the, the state level. Now there's 195 signatories to this agreement and there are 147 countries as of mid-2017, as of the time this lecture is being recorded, that have um, ratified the agreement, right? So they've actually, they've, they've, the signatory is like a commitment in principle, actually ratifying the agreement means that it's, it's implemented into your domestic law and you've agreed to abide by the, the climate treaty. Um, this is an area where we run into some complications because oftentimes um, the responsibility for 
ensuring that you are committed to a treaty or an international agreement is lodged in the executive branch of government. It's presidents, it's prime ministers, it's you know the, the formal leaders of a country and their administration and their agencies and their appointed officials. So if you have a significant change in who is in charge of the executive branch, that can lead to a significant change in your commitment to an international agreement or an international treaty, right? And that is exactly what we saw under Kyoto, uh, where you had the Clinton administration sign on to the Kyoto Protocol, then you had George W. Bush come into office, had a different perspective on the Kyoto Protocol, would not sign on, right? And now you have happening in a very significant way with the transition from the Obama administration to the Trump administration. The Obama administration, those were the individuals that were negotiating this treaty in Paris, right? His, his appointed officials, his diplomats were responsible for crafting a lot of this language. And then you have a significant change in just political orientation that comes with the election of Donald Trump. Um, the Obama administration believed that climate change was real. They believed the science behind climate change was sound. And they thought that this was something that both domestically and internationally should drive how we craft policy and the types of um, uh, priorities and, and responsibilities we have as a global leader. And Trump administration uh, views it very differently, to say the least. Trump himself has been critical of the reality of climate change. On the campaign trail, he suggested that climate change was a, a hoax perpetrated by the, the Chinese, right? So uh, he's, he is an individual with a very different perspective than Obama, and that means that the Paris Climate Treaty, the U.S. involvement in the Paris Climate Treaty, and as a result, the treaty itself is kind of under threat. It's uncertain. Um, all suggestions at this point are that uh, he probably will not continue our involvement in the Paris Climate Treaty. He'll probably withdraw from the Paris Climate Treaty. And that would be, um, you know, both in terms of the United States and our domestic policy priorities and just signaling the will of the United States to the international community to confront climate change in a meaningful way, that would be a really significant step. And it's viewed by many of our fellow world leaders and our allies, in, uh, particularly in Western Europe, uh, with trepidation. They really fear that this could unravel even the, the minor steps we've taken towards addressing uh, climate change at the global level from their perspective. He's also, at the domestic level, he's appointed officials to be heads of uh, government agencies that have a history of being skeptical towards climate change and not very proactive, to say the least, about uh, taking steps to address it. So this really uh, gives you a sense of the ways in which the Paris um, Climate Treaty itself is indicative of larger things. It's indicative of the fact that when you have a significant change in the leadership of a country that can fundamentally change the priorities that you bring into the international community and the types of um, international initiatives that you pursue as a country. And that's exactly what's happened with the Trump administration. There's just been a, a really significant change in the types of things that this administration is placing front and center as priorities relative to really any previous administrations. This is a very new and different um, set of, of leaders and, and a very new and different president for the United States. And so it, it's changing uh, some of our some of our priorities at the global level. So stay tuned on that. Uh, it's a very uncertain note on which to end this lecture, but this is still kind of unfolding as you all are taking this class. And uh, at this point, maybe by the time you watch the lecture, there will have been some sort of decision. But at this point, it's still uncertain where the Trump administration will come down on the Paris Climate Treaty. So we'll wrap up there um, for next time. The topic is thinking about the future of international relations. There's, it's not really a, a specific topical lecture like this one on the global environment. Uh, it's more just kind of thinking about what the, the future of, uh, of IR might look like. And hopefully this class has given you some of the tools to think about that in a sophisticated way. Um, you don't have any readings per se. There's a few TED Talks that um, I'd like you to watch, and the links are available in Blackboard. There's a talk by Joseph Nye on soft power. There's one by James Hansen, who's a 
well-known climate scientist, used to work for NASA and has become one of the key figures in uh, climate science and the science of global climate change. And then Majid Nawaz, uh, who is, um, has written and, and is kind of um, uh, an expert on global extremism and thinking about ways to confront global extremism. So uh, some important topics to consider as we round out this class. I'd like you to think about what you think the future of international relations will look like. You're taking this class at a really interesting time and there's a lot of questions about what that might look like. So I'd like you to think about that a little bit and hopefully this class has given you the tools to do that. And also, do we have the resources and the will to confront the challenges that face the global community? What is your perspective? Do you come away from this class um, optimistic or pessimistic or some mixture of both? And again, I hope the class has given you the tools to, to think about that in a, a slightly more sophisticated way. So um, we'll wrap up there and I'll see you next time. Thanks very much.